Patty is one of the leading figures in American philanthropy, in, in large part because she is known to have been able to be both the first deputy mayor, first, this is the, what I guess you call it, the first deputy mayor, that's, that is the title, first deputy mayor of the city of New York, right? Uh, and she was the first woman to serve in that, that, in that capacity as well. While at the same time, also, and this is a matter of the press knows this, same time running the Bloomberg Philanthropies. So, you know, she, it goes without saying that she had a tough job to do all of these things, sort of commuting from the Upper East Side downtown to the mayor's office and being in both places at the same time. Uh, in any event, she's done a spectacular job in both of those roles, as far as I could tell. Um, I've, I've followed her from the inside and from the outside, and I can tell you from the inside, everybody raves about her. And from the outside in the world of philanthropy, since she's taken over and, and spending full time as the president of Bloomberg Philanthropies, she has a reputation for being creative, courageous, um, candid, uh, gutsy, all the kinds of things one hopes that a foundation president will be, and uh, too often is not. But um, in any event, I want to welcome Patty again to speak here. She's brought some of her colleagues. She's going to, she'll introduce them separately. Uh, and I want to, to say how grateful I am to you for coming again and being with us. Uh, sorry you didn't bring Allie with you, your daughter, but nonetheless, there will be future opportunities for that, for that to occur. Uh, invitation now extended, acceptable later. <laughs> um, in any event, welcome, Patty. A great pleasure to have you here, and you will introduce the guests as well. Please. I think I should quit right there, don't you? I mean, that was a pretty good introduction, and I should say thank you. We'll see you next time. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's great to be back here. The last time I was here was in uh, 2012 with my daughter, who was still a student, and um, Allison Jaffin was here with me also. And Allison is really the chief operating officer of Bloomberg Philanthropy. Um, so we were here once before. Today, I'm also introducing and who will talk, Jim Anderson, who runs all of our government innovation program and uh, does a lot of work with cities, all our city work. So we um, had a meeting earlier in the mayor's office. Uh, we actually saw the mayor, even though he was in the middle of the horrific uh, situation. So I'm so sorry for Durham about that. But he was so kind and generous and came by and said, thank you for your support for our city. So. Anyway, we just have to hope that turns out OK. We three of us all worked at City Hall together. And now it's great to be full time at Bloomberg Philanthropies. And um, I want to start with a little bit telling you a little bit about Mike Bloomberg, who's our founder and also our funder. His commitment to philanthropy really began when he was a tiny youngster. Um, here he is uh, as the, one of the youngest Eagle Scouts. He'd probably say the youngest. Um, that ever existed. He's with his mom and his dad and his sister. And he learned about philanthropy at a really young age. His parents just brought him up that, uh, with the importance of giving back. You can see he gave his first gift to Johns Hopkins, which was $5 when he graduated. We've tracked down the documentation to make sure that this legend is true. Um, in the 80s and 90s, he was running Bloomberg LP, his technology and information and data company, financial information, which started with um, four people in the room with a coffee pot, as he likes to say, and has grown into a very, very successful company, global company. Um, but he always thought that it was very important for the culture of Bloomberg, the employees to give back, and also for the company to give back in cities where they did business. He served as mayor for 12 years, which was the ultimate um, philanthropy, if you will. He took a dollar a year. And there he is again with his mother. She's right in the middle. Um, she was very proud of him. And she lived to be, I think, 103. Yeah, which is an amazing thing. Um, Bloomberg Philanthropies really was founded formally in 2006. I started working for Mike in 1994. We gave away $2 million. Last year, we gave away, committed, actually gave away 767. So the philanthropy has grown because of the success of the company. And what Mike likes to say is that almost all of the profits of Bloomberg LP will go to the foundation, which is something very special. And most organizations or companies can't say that, right? OK. Um, 
I wanted to tell you a little bit about what Bloomberg Philanthropies is, just in a nutshell. We decided that there was the corporate giving, the personal giving, and then the foundation giving. And we decided it would be much simpler to put it all under one umbrella since the money was really coming from the same place. And so the corporate, as I said before, is really um, focused on being a good corporate citizen. There are 19,000 employees, 12,000 volunteered last year. And the company supported a lot of not small, not, not small, but smaller grants to nonprofits in cities where we have business and where the employees work. The personal giving really is also about his personal interests. Um, and then the foundation is really the big strategic initiatives, which we're going to talk about today. I think, you know, as we've evolved over time, we decided that we really had to uh, focus on big issues and um, really define what our priorities were and not try to be everything to everyone. I think we must have read that in one of your books, right? <laughs> Learn from you. Um, and all of the areas that we um, support, the arts, education, environment, government, innovation, and public health, each come out of a really personal part of Mike Bloomberg's life. So I'm going to touch on that. We also uh, work in 120 countries and 480 cities globally. And we focus on issues, often we pilot them and then scale them in the foundation work. So uh, this is showing where some of the pilots are and where we've scaled our work. But we're really touching all over the globe. And I just should say that in the last year and a half, we've sort of looked inside and focused a little more in the US than we did two years ago because we thought we could make a big difference there. And Maybe we were needed. Um, so anyway, our mission is to ensure better, longer lives for the greatest number of people around the world. And I'm going to go through each of these areas and give you a little of the backstory, why we're in it, and some highlights of what we're doing. So the first thing I want to talk about is our approach, because it really applies to everything. I think that every foundation has its own approach, and you can define it any way you want to. But this is how we've decided to uh, discuss it. So first of all, we look for unmet needs, which is something that someone issues that aren't getting enough attention. Tobacco, as an example, is one where we just felt there wasn't a movement to stop tobacco and curtail it. And so 10 years ago, I think we, st we created a tobacco initiative in a couple of different countries, and it's now really expanded. Um, but it's something that we felt we could take a leadership role on, we could make a difference. And we call that an unmet need. And in much of our work, we try to see what we could do that nobody else is doing. We rely on data. Again, public health, we look at causes of death and then try to um, see what's causing the death and how we could stop it. There's a line that we always say, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So we look at data to see where we think we want to begin our work, but we also aren't afraid to look at numbers along the way so that if we're not doing as well as we should, we can redirect a program. We use advocacy, um, sorry, we don't shy away from controversy. So those are really hot button issues, guns, tobacco. We have a, f a founder and a funder and a leader who is alive and active and he wants to make a difference. And so we're not a legacy foundation. We are really, you know, prepared to jump in. We also can use advocacy and lobbying, which does distinguish us from a lot of other foundations, because he can use the personal money and the triangle I showed you before to spend on advocacy and lobbying and sort of mirror that work with what our strategic goals are. So that, I think, really distinguishes us from a lot of other philanthropies. Um, and it really helps us align our resources together. Uh, we love partnerships. Some of our partners and people who've been generous to our programs are in the room. Um, I think thank you for that. I think that some foundations just want to do things by themselves and no judgment there. But we really like to partner with both governments, with individuals, with corporations, and with other foundations, depending on where we can match up our interests. We like to be flexible. Um, even though we like to plan, we want to be opportunistic. So. Bill Gates called Mike Bloomberg one day and said, we're working to eradicate polio, and it's only in three countries, and I need your help. And instead of studying this for a year and looking at the history, you know, we just believed in the Gates Foundation and their work and did a little homework, not, you know, but we said we're in. So we hopefully will be part of that 
um, eradication, and they're making progress, and we're proud of that. So we can't do everything flexibly, but we try to do that. And then finally, we focus on cities. I think that really comes out of Mike Bloomberg's experience as a mayor. He saw, as a mayor, you can come up with ideas, and you can execute them. And he really believes that that's where it's easier to make change in cities rather than working with federal governments. Um, so now we're going to touch on each of our program areas. So I'll begin with the environment. In the Bloomberg administration, um, Mike said to city agencies, come up with a sustainability plan, please. We want to see what can we do to make sure that our city is prepared. And he saw that we could really do a lot um, to make the city more prepared for climate change. He then looked at his company and said, we have to be a global leader as well. And then he said, I think this is something my foundation should focus on. So he accepted a position as UN Special Envoy for Climate Change in Cities. And he's using his voice and his time to really help bring people together and focus on the attention. And you could say, why? And we think it's really a challenge of our time, one of the biggest challenges we can look at. So um, that's, real, that's Mike with President, Vice President Al Gore painting the roofs white in New York City to reduce um, emissions. And then here he is accepting his honor as special envoy. OK, um, beyond call. So one of the, now I'm just going to talk about a couple of the programs that we're doing in this area, because we're doing a lot. And we picked a few highlights that we want to touch on. So we're working around the world and trying to affect climate change. And we came up with a program working with the Sierra Club initially, which we called Beyond Coal. And we've already had an impact already. We focused in the United States to try to close or um, retire um, coal-fired power plants. So far, 287 have been closed out of 530 since 2011. And if you want the stats on North Carolina, I thought I'd tell you that too. There are 24 plants. 14 have been retired or announced to be retired. There are 10 remaining, and two we're trying to get. They're trying to close by 2020. So that's in your backyard. Hopefully, your air will be a bit cleaner. We also have a program where we're working with um, some of the individuals who worked at the plants to try to help them be job ready for other uh, positions, but really to close the plants. We started a program in Europe, too, um, where we've been able to make a difference there. And the impact has been 58 out of 320 that were opened in 2016. So it's a concrete, specific program um, that we feel like we're making progress in. We're also working on our oceans. Uh, we started a program to try to protect the op oceans um, from climate change and overfishing. And we're, again, our theme was local leaders for global policy. And this is a food, public health, environmental issue. And so we really felt that we could make a difference in oceans. We say that we've protected or helped to protect more than 4 million square miles of ocean. And that's larger than the size of Mexico and Canada. So again, you know, using data to try to quantify what we're doing. Uh, um, one of the most creative things I think we do is we support networks of cities to try to share best practices. And in um, the environmental work, and Jim will talk about this more later, we have a big coalition of states and cities and businesses as part of what we call America's Pledge to meet the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. And I'm just going to tell you a little anecdote about that, because it goes back to what I said about staying flexible. So on June 1st, the president withdrew from the Paris Agreement. On June 2nd, 24 hours later, Mike Bloomberg was there with the president of France and the mayor of Paris at a press conference announcing that we're still in. And so he jumped in. He said, I'm going to do a couple of things. I'm going to rally businesses and cities and colleges and universities. And we're going to meet our goals. We're going to measure progress on behalf of the United States. This is a UN job. But we're going to have to fund that office, too, since the US is pulling out. And so we created something called America's Pledge. Again, we had a conference in November. We released reports about local impact. We had another global summit, sorry, in San Francisco. 
progress is hard, progress is challenging, but it's happening. And then in the fall and winter of last year, we launched a program to focus on the top 25 largest cities in the US and give them technical assistance on how they could focus on buildings and transportation. And from a foundation point of view, one of the things I found really exciting about this program is that we took two departments in our office, the environmental group and the city's government innovation group, and they were working together and um, bringing each, each one's expertise to make a really solid program. So we're excited about that. Education. Um, the second program I want to talk about is education. Back to our founder, Mike began, he always thought that education was the answer to alleviating um, poverty, I guess, or really income inequality is what we would say now. And so he's always been passionate about education and every type of education. So when I first started working for him, he was on multiple boards. He was on the board of Johns Hopkins, later became chair. Um, and then when he ran for mayor, the city's depart the Department of Education, K through 12, was accountable to no one. So literally, there are a lot of board members, the governor, the mayor, borough presidents, but no one was the boss. So he said, I'm going to run. He created a line called Students First. And then he said he got the state to change the legislation so that uh, Department of Education would be accountable to the mayor for better or worse. And so really passionate about that. And recently, maybe you've read that he made a huge gift to Johns Hopkins University, still writing checks, um, for $1.8 billion to make the university need blind. And he always says there should be a statue at Johns Hopkins of the admissions director, not him. Because, <laughs> so you know that's his joke about uh, Johns Hopkins. Um, a quote on the bottom, sorry, Jamie which I think is good. If we're serious about promoting social mobility in America, we need to ensure every qualified high school student in the US has an opportunity to attend college. And so one of the things we did was, OK, we had that point of view. What could we do? And we came up with a program, which again, we could call it an unmet need, but it focused on partnership, where we tried to look at the lower income, high achieving students who were graduating from high school but who did not go to college in the United States. And we estimated there were about 75,000 of them who we could make a difference with. And so we created a virtual advising program, which was from phone, by the phone and online, reaching out to kids all through America, many whose um, parents had not gone to college or maybe didn't even have a college advisor or mentor that many of us have been so lucky to have, and help them through the process, through the applications, and the whole um, gamut of trying to decide how to go to college. It's a big decision. How can you go? How can you afford it? And all of that. We then decided we had the kids who were starting to be interested in this, and we needed to reach out to the colleges. So we designed what we called the American Talent Initiative. And now we're working with 100 colleges and universities, of course Duke is in, um, who have a goal of reaching 50,000 high achieving low income kids by 2025. So this is a group of college presidents who, a new organization, if you will, who had never focused on something like this together before. And we brought them to Bloomberg and um, have worked with them very thoroughly. So don't take my word for it. Um, we're going to show you a video. And one of our students in this room, one of your students, is on the video. So thank you, Michelle. I always knew that I wanted to leave Florida for college when I was younger. I really wanted to step outside of my comfort zone and just have a completely different experience. I'm a first generation college student. My parents had never been through the process at all. My parents only got a high school education. I knew I wanted to somehow thank them, but also I really just wanted to make something of myself. I know that knowledge in this world is what's most important in taking you places. It's just been basically me and my mom for the past like 18 years. Growing up in a low-income household, it became really important for me to go to a school where they gave me a full ride. I didn't want that burden of having to go to a school knowing I was in debt and having to pay all that off. My dad finished school and he had like an enormous student debt even though he worked through college. Junior year, they were like, all right, when you go to college, you need to find scholarships because we can't pay for it. Even if we only have to pay like 8,000 a year, we still can't do it. It was like on my shoulders entirely to find the payment. 
I first learned about College Point from a phone call that I got shortly after taking my PSAT. In May, I got a call uh, from College Point, and they were like, hey, do you want to be part of this free service that gives college advising? My College Point advisor, Shannon, helped me throughout my entire application process, filling out essays and filling out financial aid information. She helped me throughout absolutely everything. She was there throughout the financial process, actually applying, deciding what school I should go to. Having her call me on a regular basis and email me with information like, oh, hey, FAST was due soon, or hey, the CSS profile is due soon, really helped me. We had monthly calls where she would advise me on what I was doing and what I could be doing better or what I needed to be doing to meet my goals. But anytime that I needed anything, I could just email her and she would reply almost instantly. It gave me peace of mind that I could go to someone with any question I had. I know that the education here is going to prepare me for whatever I come across in life. And I wouldn't be here today without the help of College Point. Attending a great school it gives you the most opportunities to do whatever you want. Thanks to College Point, I could finally attend my dream school, the University of Michigan. I couldn't be here without you. It always brings a smile to my face. And that like moment where I realized that, wow, you got into Duke. You did something. When I wake up, I feel really good knowing that I made it to this great place and now I'm going somewhere even greater. My name is Michelle Kitty Mosswell. Brian Marie. Priscilla Pushani. Tom Dix. And I'm majoring in biology. And OBGYN. Computer science. Biopsychology, cognition, and neuroscience. Here at Claremont McKenna College. University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Duke University. The University of Michigan. Thank you, College Point. This wouldn't have been possible without all of your help. But so far, um, 7,000 students, in the, it's only been two years, and 7,000 students have now um, attended college through this program. And it's really interesting when I talked about tweaking something. First, we thought just texting everybody would work, and we, were, and we weren't getting the um, responses that we thought we should get. So we did some focus groups and found that calling was much more effective because no one makes phone calls anymore. You know, if you're 16 or 17, you're texting. So a phone call seems a little more urgent. I don't know if that's true or not. But that, our numbers have increased after we started using the phone. Um, anyway, we're very, this is an interesting program, different um, partners, unmet needs. The third program I want to talk about is the arts, where we really think that the arts have the power to spur economic growth and bring communities together and improve life. As a corporation, Bloomberg LP, um, was a big supporter of art through all of the years. Um, here's a photo that was taken last December in London where we sponsored a big piece by Olafur Eliasson, which are blocks of ice that do not exist right now. They melted quite quickly, um, which was in a way an art project that focused on the environment, so we love that. Um, and then um, at City Hall, we worked very hard to increase access to the arts. We had more than 500 public art projects. So we really tried to make New York a cultural, to support the great cultural network from small groups to big organizations. And it's been in our DNA ever since. At Bloomberg Philanthropies, there are three things we do, or this is the way we've defined it. We support artists, audiences, and cultural organizations. And so, we created a program to support artists, which was a public art challenge. We put out an RFP and said to mayors, come up with an idea that is created by an artist that will tackle a social issue in your city. So we've done this twice. We had more than 400 cities apply. Um, we had five winners the first year, um, and I think five this time, five or six. Anyway, it was about 10 total. And the first challenge, we think, catalyzed about $13 million in economic growth. The picture, this is in um, Coral Gables, Florida, um, which is the most recent work we commissioned. And it's really um, part of the Parkland community. So it was built by the first responders, the students, the parents, the community, by a world-renowned artist named David Best. So very touching and moving. Um, supporting audiences, we have a program called Bloomberg Connects where we're trying to uh, increase access through technology. Mike Bloomberg always said when he goes to a museum, he gets the personalized tour, but I might not. So now um, we've supported audio guides. We're now changing that into an app that could be used globally. We're very excited about this. 
and we've um, supported 15 culturals, but we think this is going to be hundreds and hundreds by the next time I get to talk to Joel's class. Okay. <laughs> and then institutions, we have a program where we're supporting small and mid-sized arts organizations and trying to help them think of themselves as a small business so they can really be lean and mean and efficient. And um, we've supported about 500 since 2012. We're teaching them fundraising, accounting, management skills. Can show you the next slide where we're working. These are the cities we've been working in. Um, we started this in New York as a pilot and have now grown to this. And um, I'm going to show you another video which really talks about what this program does. <laughs> It is vital that we train the leaders of arts organizations, both staff members and board members, to be able to identify new sources of revenue and to ensure that they are making the decisions that are going to help them prosper in the future. This program builds strengths in marketing, communications, strategic planning, fundraising, board development, all the tools that they need to really enhance their organizations. Boston Baroque is the oldest period instrument orchestra in America. The Auspike Dance Theater is a 41-year-old contemporary modern dance organization. Bay Cat is a nonprofit social enterprise. We're here to end racism one story at a time. Being invited to be part of the Bloomberg AIM cohort was one of the most exciting opportunities. I remember still getting the first phone call and going, what, are you kidding me? The things that we got from AIM were numerous. Before we participated in the AIM program, our social media was scattered across the organization and we have seen our media presence and our social media activity increase tenfold. We launched Boston Baroque Radio as an internet radio station a few years ago, and part of what we worked with AIM on was how do we expand that? Within six months, the listenership grew to 200,000 listeners per week. What was brilliant about this one-on-one -on -one mentorship was that we had these check-ins on a monthly basis where we were allowed to really talk about our challenges. One of the things that we were able to do was to be able to plan an endowment strategy and be able to move forward with solicitations that would help us with sustainability of the organization. One of the most important things that I learned from the AIM program was this five-year programmatic planning process. Know what we're doing through 2023, and it allows us the time to raise the money that we need to get to the programs that we're doing we saw board members begin to see with clarity what their roles are and what it was that they needed to do to grow the organization. The city focus of the AIM program is unique, allowing us to work with so many different organizations in one city and to watch not just an organization change, but a whole arts ecology change. And that is what makes the Bloomberg Philanthropy's approach to arts funding so important. What lives behind after this grant is really the confidence to know that we could do much bigger and better things. Um, be better, right? Teaching to fish, I guess is how some would put it. So anyway, I'll be back. I'd like to introduce Allison Jaffin, who's going to talk about our public health work and also how we make big strategic decisions. Allison worked at Mike Bloomberg's company. Um, she then worked at City Hall and then came to the foundation. So all yours. Hi. Can you hear me? Okay, great. Um, so I'm going to talk about public health and just starting sort of uh, in the 
the way that Patty did to talk about why we're involved in public health to begin with and where Mike Bloomberg's interest in public health comes from. Um, first of all, I think public health caught his interest when he was on the board of Johns Hopkins and he learned about the School of Public Health, now called the Bloomberg School of Pu Public Health at Hopkins. He understood that success in public health is measured in millions of lives saved, um, and I think that appealed to him. Um, in addition, he understood there was a really good role for philanthropy, um, a, a, a specific role for philanthropy um, to get involved in public health because unlike in medical research, in public health there are no grateful patients. In other words, you know who to thank if someone saves your family member's life, but you don't know who to thank if you don't die in a car accident because you wore a seatbelt or you didn't have other medical problems because you did something preventative you didn't even know you were doing. And so as mayor, he was a fearless public health advocate, often unpopular for it. Um, one of the first things he did as mayor was ban smoking in public places. And he loves to tell the story about marching in parades after making that announcement and getting a lot of what he called one finger waves. <laughs> and it's not this finger. <laughs> <laughs> And so, um, but, what he, but one of the things he would say he's most proud of during his time in office is that life expectancy in New York City went up three years, and it was greater, it was three years greater than the national average by the time he left office. Um, and so you can have an enormous impact working in public health. Um, he's now the uh, global ambassador for the WHO, the World Health Organization, um, and that is because of our focus on non-communicable diseases. The reason we focus on non-communicable diseases is because they are, to Patty's point about looking at the data, they're an enormous unmet need. 65% of deaths worldwide are estimated to be caused by a non-communicable disease, and yet 2% of global funding goes to pre prevent them. And so, um, so we believe there's a really big role for us there. The first non-communicable disease I'm going to talk about um, briefly is obesity. Um, we have worked. Um, in order to address the global um, obesity crisis, we've worked to pass sugary beverage taxes. Um, we worked with the government of Mexico. They managed to pass um, a very strong sugary beverage tax. And because we are so focused on data, we also funded an evaluation. And so we know that consumption dropped nearly 10%, um, which was a pretty unbelievable outcome. And from there, many other countries contacted us and contacted Mexico to see if it was something that they could implement. So we've also since seen the South African parliament um, in 2017 passed a very similar tax. And then 30 other um, municipalities, states, or countries combined have passed taxes, seven here in the US. Um, so hopefully, we'll begin to see an effect on um, obesity. But at, right now, what we know is it does reduce consumption of um, sugary beverages. Um, the next program I wanted to mention, which is not a non-communicable disease, but it is injury prevention, so similarly something you can't catch, um, it, uh, in our road safety program, what appeals to us about road safety, which is also what appeals to us about tobacco control, is that we know exactly what needs to be done. We know that if governments implement certain um, interventions, for example, if you have, they're very obvious, anyone in this room could probably guess them, if you have seatbelt laws, if you have speed limits and you enforce them, if you don't allow drunk driving, um, your road safety injuries and deaths come down substantially. And so we work with governments and partners on the ground to um, encourage them to pass legislation that, that saves lives. Um, similarly with tobacco control, um, when we got involved in tobacco control more than a decade ago, the trend so we got involved in 2007 the trend um, in terms of cigarettes sold was was um, increasing, and it was not expected to come down anytime soon. Uh, we really do believe that through our partnerships and through our work, we have stemmed that and managed to bring um, cigarette sales down globally. And at this point, although it was unthinkable in 2007, that is mostly driven by China, um, where we thought we would almost never make progress. And at this point, as you see here, 11 cities in China are now smoke-free, covering 110 pe million people. So um, it was sort of unthinkable when we started, and, um, and, and we've been really proud of the success there. However, the program I'm going to focus on um, for this presentation is our maternal health program. And um, we, I think that maybe the best thing to do is I'm going to show you a video, and then I'll um, explain to you how we got into maternal health and why we chose to fund what we fund in Tanzania.
akakuwa na mimba utahofu nitapona salama nikibeba mimba nitaipona salama hii mimba Bloomberg Philanthropy's mission is to let people live longer, better lives. I'm not willing to say that's just the way it is, particularly when I think we can do something about it. We started the maternal and reproductive health program in Tanzania back in 2006. Kigoma region is the size of the average American state. There are two million people, and when we began this program, there wasn't a single obstetrician to serve them. Our approach was to train assistant medical officers, these are non-physician clinicians, in emergency obstetric care, including cesarean section, and also train nurse midwives in anesthesia. Mrs. Jackson, akitokea kijiji cha Chagu, ambacho kiko kilometer zaidi ya 47. Usiku muda wa saa 5 kwenda saa sita, kama mjamzito nikasikia kama vile kuna maji yanamwagika, kuinuka na kutani damu, damu zikamwagika kweli. Alipofika hapa, nikampokea, nikamchunguza, nikampatia huduma ya kwanza. Tizo lilokuwa nalo kwa hapa ni singeweza kumsaidia. Alafu nika piga simu kituo cha afya nguruka akaenda akafanywa huduma zingine huko hospitali. Nalipofika hapo usiku tu watu tumeshikuwa tumeshajipanga kwa hiyo tulimsaidia kwa kumleta haraka ya theater kumfanyia operation bila operation mama angepoteza maisha hata kutoka damu tu angeenda kwenye shoko na mtoto kupoteza maisha. Nisikia furaha sana, nikajua niko hai na mtoto wangu yuko hai. Kajia mgeni, anampenda sana Jovina, anajua kama ni mtoto waki. The second component of the project is a focus on family planning. We know that the best way to prevent a maternal death is to prevent an unintended pregnancy. So we decided that it was important to inform women about the benefits of contraceptives and make sure there were skilled providers who could offer her her contraceptive method of choice. Na mimba kumina moja, na atoto atama, alafu mtoto ata akishinda kuenda shule, siwezi ni kamsomasha. Kulingana, na uzo nulionao mdogo, Leo nikachagua nje ya kufunga. Yaani mimi nipo na kliniki tuliongea na Messi, Judy. Na Judy ndiye akaniambia hivi, naomba uchague njia moja. Sasa mtoto alikuwa mpaka na malnutrition. Huyo mtoto wa mwisho huyo, yani alikuwa na severe. Lakini sasa hizi amekuwa na afya nzuri. Nitafanya kazi ya kilimo. Nikifanya kazi ya kilimo ile kazi ya kilimo kiniingizia nitakuwa nimepata ufaudu wa kuwalea watoto wangu vizuri. We've served over 380,000 clients with the contraceptive method of their choice. We've prevented over 580,000 unintended pregnancies and simultaneously most women in Kigoma are delivering in a healthcare facility with a skilled provider. All of this combined means that every year we've prevented hundreds of maternal, newborn, and child deaths. Private philanthropy creates the idea, shows it can be done, and then the government takes it on to the next step. And that's where we are in Tanzania. Kwa hiyo, si haki kwa 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 kw
na hii ni, ni haki ambayo imeainishwa ime kwenye hati za umoja wa mataifa quickly summarize that although it's obviously said way better than I ever could we saw a problem we um, figured out we, we tried three um, interventions to address it we upgraded remote health clinics we trained non-physicians to perform c-sections and other basic life-saving surgeries and then we offered um, family planning assistance to women in the community so I think that begs the question how did we choose those three things why are we involved in those in, in that um, in that way in Tanzania, and how do we know when we've given enough money and it's time to move on? And so I thought I would just walk you through the life cycle of an initiative or something we call the innovation curve. Um, just to quickly step through it, the, the far left side of the curve where every problem starts is you need to identify the problem. Then you would have to generate ideas to find evidence-based solutions, then try those ideas, pilot them, implement the ones that work, obviously, on a large scale, and then look to sustain the impact. In the case of maternal health in Tanzania, the program was, was very clear. We knew how many women were dying, and we knew what they were dying from. Um, I, ideas existed, so we didn't, um, we didn't come up with the idea to do the three things we did. Those ideas already existed, but no one was really piloting them or trying them in a bigger way. And so that's where we came in. We came in at the pilot stage. So in 2007, we agreed to pilot um, two of the ideas that, that um, the video spoke about, the idea to upgrade the remote health centers and um, to train non-physicians and um, in, in Kagoma, only in that one region. Uh, what we saw um, through, through piloting those ideas is that they did work, um, but that there was an, uh, an increased need. And there, there were sort of two increased needs. One was we needed more women to come in and to deliver in our in our upgraded facilities, they weren't used to that many, we're used to delivering at home. Um, and second, we decided to add the, um, the uh, maternal, uh, sorry, the family planning services to, um, to meet a need that we heard from the women there, but also to incentivize them more to come into the clinics um, for family planning and then hopefully for delivery. Um, in all, by 2017, we had upgraded um, 90 health facilities in Kagoma and the surrounding regions, and the government took notice. All along, we worked with government. We obviously were not doing this in their country without their permission, but they weren't co-funding it with us. They were watching us and working with us, but they were not invested in it. And so just this month, actually, um, the government is taking over our program. They believe that it has proven to work and they are gonna scale it across the entire country. And so this is the moment where, it is, where our funding ends and we move on in a very successful way um, with the government taking over. And uh, so that is, that is our story in Tanzania on maternal health and that is how we think about the lifespan of an initiative. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Jim Anderson. Oh, sorry, I, should, I think the video said, but we've delivered 100,000 babies since we started the program. 6,400 C-sections. Um, the video said 380,000 clients are connected with a contraceptive method of their choice. And the best statistic is that now, is that as of um, 2018, 72% of women in the communities where we're working are delivering in a clinical setting, um, up from 48% when we started. So I turn it over to Jim Anderson, who runs our um, government innovation work. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so it's nice to be here. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that we do in cities, and specifically the work that we do to help government solve problems in bigger, bolder, more effective ways, uh, work that is now happening in cities all over the, the globe. Um, you might be asking, like, why so much of a focus on cities? The first um, answer there is, is Mike Bloomberg. He is unique amongst funders in terms of having run a big city and, and sort of understanding the possibilities of cities putting forward big new ideas, scaling them up, and the connection that that has to global change. And I think that's really clear when you think about climate action. Number two, the world is urbanizing. Today, 54% of the global population is affected by policies that are created by mayors that will go up to 70% by 2050. In the United States, that's already at 80%. 
Third, we actually think this is a great place for high leverage philanthropy. Local government is an incredible platform to test new ideas, to figure out what works, and to quickly scale things up. It's kind of hard to imagine getting to citywide scale and impact if you're not working with or around local government. A lot of philanthropies aren't quite as comfortable doing that. And then lastly, local government is the level of government that still works. Uh, governments are very close to the ground. Local progress can drive global change, but cities are chronically under-resourced, chronically understaffed, chronically over-mandated, and they need help. And this is really one of those unmet need areas. Again, philanthropy has sort of taken an arm's length approach to investments directly in local governments, and we believe that you gotta go all in. We do um, uh, this work in a lot of different ways because cities are really different. Their needs are different, their priorities are different, and we recognize that we need to have a really differentiated approach that meets them where they're at. And that's why we've sort of developed a, a, a range of ways that we uh, work with cities. We use competitions um, to unleash and support the creativity within local governments. Mike has always believed that it's difficult for public sector to use public funds to try ideas that are really bold and really out there. But this is a great role for philanthropy. We've run our flagship uh, competition, the Mayor's Challenge, four times on three continents. 1,300 cities have participated. And through that program, we've given away $24 million in innovation grants to allow cities to try new things. Um, we also uh, do a lot to support the capacity uh, development. Sorry, just there we go. Um, we also provide leadership development and 21st century skills building in city halls all over the place. For example, every year through the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative, we provide 40 mayors and their senior leadership teams with robust leadership development and skills building. This really addresses a pretty important gap in the private sector in America this year. We will spend $14 billion on leadership development. For mayors, there's virtually nothing. And yet these public sector CEOs are coming in, usually with little to no executive experience, managing thousands of people, multi-million dollar budgets, and responsible for services that we all rely on. So we need them to grow and become stronger as leaders. We fund staff uh, in city halls all over the globe. Our innovation teams program uh, creates dedicated teams in mayor's offices that are solely focused on bringing creative new approaches to the toughest challenges that a city faces. And I'll say a lot more about the innovation teams program, which happens to be happening here in Durham in a moment. We also consult. Uh, Mike Bloomberg started a pro bono consulting firm. It's called Bloomberg Associates that works with cities all over the globe. This is probably the most extensive way that we work with individual cities. We send former commissioners and deputy mayors from the Bloomberg administration in to give deep coaching, deep mentoring to cities over an extended length of time focused on a range of quality of life issues. Um, $1 billion, we estimate, worth of in-depth advice to city leaders has already been expended. You'll see a list of cities where we've worked there on the right. In, in this neck of the woods, we're doing some incredible new work with Keisha Lance Bottoms in Atlanta, also doing some really important work in Nashville, Tennessee. This year, we'll pick up another one or two cities here in the United States to add to that portfolio. And then finally, Patty mentioned the power of convenings. We take that really seriously in the city's work. The power of cities sharing with other cities is a force to be reckoned with. And there's a huge appetite in city halls to learn about innovations that are happening in other places, to adapt them, and to see if they can create benefit um, for residents in their own home. We also make a big point of helping cities share lessons learned and failures, because we know that cities can learn as much from those as they can from the success stories, which all too often um, end up in the newspapers, and, and the, the lessons learned are just as important. So across our whole organization, Patty's mentioned a little bit of this, we do a ton of work in North Carolina. Um, she mentioned the work that we've done to help shutter some of the dirty coal fire plants in the state. Um, four of your great universities are part of that American Talent Initiative, which Patty mentioned earlier. And some of our public health obesity work is happening in partnership with UNC. Our programs, the government innovation programs, have also been super active uh, with Durham City Hall. Um, I don't know if you know this. Durham is one of nine winners of our most recent innovation competition, the Mayor's Challenge. And it's a really exciting idea. Durham won 
uh, for its very creative partnership with Duke Center for Advanced Hindsight, which aims to get single occupancy commuters into the downtown core to make a better decision to opt out of ride public transit to walk or to bike. And they're doing some incredible experiments that are producing some really significant impact. Mayor Schul and his team are also participants in the current class of the Bloomberg Harvard City Leadership Initiative. So he and his um, Deputy Mayor Bertha Johnson, I believe is her name, and a couple of other wonderful um, civic officials from your city are coming to New York and participating in that classroom. And then finally, Durham has been participating for the last two years in one of my very favorite programs, our innovation team programs. Uh, we call that the I-teams. Um, so what's an I-team? Um, has anybody heard of one before? We actually have local news often has I-teams. I mean a different kind of, not an investigatory team. So we make a big deal out of these innovation teams. They are usually comprised of three to five people. They bring a really different set of skills into City Hall, Does, uh, data science, civic design, resident engagement. And they use those different skills and different approaches to sort of get civic officials to think differently about the problems that they face. Um, what we know from the research is that good innovation requires dedicated people, dedicated resources, and a rigorous approach. Mike Bloomberg knew that when he came into City Hall, and he created a number of innovation teams because he came out of the private sector and he knew that that's what he needed to do to drive change in his priority areas. But for most of the public sector, this is really foreign terrain. This is really unknown. Um, mayors, mayors don't know what to do. They don't know what to fund. Um, and they don't always believe that public dollars should be used for it. So Ali talked about the life cycle of an initiative, and this is another great way to explain this initiative. When we came in, we realized mayors were not investing in innovation. Categorically, mayors weren't doing it. We had an idea. We needed to develop a model that we could test in a number of places, the IT model. We tested it in five cities. Um, it blew us away. It worked in very different cities with different mayors, with different leadership approaches. We dramatically expanded the experiment to 30 cities across four continents, Canada, France, Israel, and the United States. It has continued to power big results. And I'll talk in a moment about how we're trying to sort of sustain that movement post um, Bloomberg Philanthropies um, funding. Uh, I'm also going to show you a video. This is a video that focuses on the innovation team that we've been funding in the city of Los Angeles. And it will give you a really great sense of, of sort of what these guys do on, on, in their day-to-day -day work. Cities are growing. Half the people in the world live in cities. Pretty soon, two-thirds will live in the cities. Cities are incapable of taking care of that growth unless they change and do new things. What we're trying to do is to help governments all over the world to try something that's new outside the box. The Innovation Teams program is one of the first things that we started here at Bloomberg Philanthropies. We fund staff to work for a mayor to really serve as an in-house consultancy within city government. They are focused on experimentation, R&D, using design to expand the way that we're thinking about what's possible. I-teams inject those new ways of thinking into city halls to help them dream bigger and create better solutions. So one example of a really successful I-team is LA. Over the past couple of years, the mayor has tasked them with working on a couple of different pressing problems for the city. One of those is making sure that as the rents have steadily increased in LA, that the residents are able to stay in their apartments and their homes. The other one is to strengthen and diversify the police force. The Los Angeles Police Department is estimated to lose 40% of its workforce by 2021. And when you look even further at the demographics, about 50 to 60% of the African American population will retire. Female officers will retire. The I-Team is trying to figure out if 40% of the police force will retire, what do we do to restore that? And how do we focus on diversity? We do ride-alongs so that we can understand sort of a day in the life of police officers. It's really important that we understand factually what people do and what the job is actually like. Buildings are over there. This is my okay. We're about to participate in the Candidate Advancement Program, which is a training program for LAPD candidates who are in the hiring process. 
We are out here because the I team wants to immerse ourselves in the candidate experience. One of the things that we've launched is called Officer Chip. It's basically an online chat where uh, potential recruits can go onto the LAPD website and they can ask questions. About 40 or 50 recruits are using it daily. It uses AI to essentially get smarter over time. Los Angeles has really incredible youth programs, but one thing that we weren't necessarily doing was continuing them from those youth programs into becoming officers. We've created a program called Pledge to Patrol. What that program essentially does is build a pipeline from all of these youth programs into a sworn position in the LAPD. We call them ACOPs, and it's basically an apprenticeship program. They're working with police officers at the front desk. They're going out on ride-alongs. They're getting trained before they actually enter into the official process. So what does the ACOP stand for? Associate Community Officer. It's cool. It's like you're seeing the job from the inside out. I went to the Police Orientation Preparation Program. I graduated at 19 years old. This came perfect timing. I was so happy. Like before this, I was working at In-N-Out. I would sit there and like when the, you know, we'd have the police come in, I would secretly want to be out there and taking their order. When the day I knew I could quit that job and come on to here, I've never dreaded a day of work. I feel so official. I'm literally a police officer and just unarmed. Walking through the doors as an A-cop and then walking through the doors as a P1, like it's legendary. One of the special parts of the I-Team program is for the city to work together and help one another. As LA was finishing up its project, Baltimore was just beginning the same project in their city, so they were able to really quickly get a lot of lessons learned and insights from LA, which was really helpful. One city's experience is feeding in and strengthening the next city's experience, and we really are trying to create a community of cities that are all focused on creating that culture of continuous innovation. Good ideas come from every place. You've just got to find a ways to get those and, and implement them. Things are changing too rapidly. And this is one of the programs that Bloomberg Philanthropies has where we try to get cities ready to accommodate the world of tomorrow. They're currently focusing on driving a really radical idea which is to get single family residents to build sort of mother-in-law apartments in their backyards and to serve the city of Los Angeles by housing a homeless family in that unit for a couple period, for a period of two or three years. And in exchange, they're gonna waive the fees, the regulatory and permitting fees associated with building that unit. Um, so it's a really outside the box radical idea, but sort of of the right size, given the, fa the, uh, the size of the homelessness challenge in, in Los Angeles. And that's an example, I, I think, across all of these I-teams. Over the last several years, they've tested somewhere close to three, 277 initiatives. Some of them have worked. Some of them have not. Many of them have been in real nuts and bolts kinds of issues, like Memphis there on the bottom. The mayor was really, really frustrated with three or four core commercial corridors in distressed areas of the city where commercial vacancy rates were so high and he just couldn't convince businesses to start there. The innovation team canvassed cities all over the globe, brought a bunch of very creative pop-up economic development initiatives into the city. Two years later, commercial vacancy rates reduced by 82% on those cor corridors. In Tel Aviv, focusing on an issue that you don't necessarily think is a mayor's business. He's got lots of young families in the city of Tel Aviv, a very expensive city, and he tasked his I-team with saying, what could we do to reduce the cost of living for young families in the city of Tel Aviv? So they looked at two of the big drivers, education and housing, and education started experimenting with a bunch of different models to expand the supply of preschool providers, to reduce the cost of tutoring, the tutoring pilot just ended and saved 
um, the pilot families on average $500 per student, which is real money. Um, so we're excited about that result. But you should know that probably one of the most exciting innovation teams happens to be in your own backyard. Um, and we had the privilege of meeting with the team today and getting a sort of behind the scenes look at what they're up to. We started funding Mayor Shul and the innovation team in Durham in 2017. The mayor focused the team um, on a really critical challenge that so many cities are facing. Let's remove barriers to employment, particularly for the segment of our population that is justice involved. Uh, although we know that uh, many of these individuals have committed low-level offenses and are not a threat to public safety, they are effectively shut out of the economy because they can't secure sustained steady employment, oftentimes because they can't get a driver's license. In fact, the I-team was telling us today that when they did their ethnographic research, so you saw the LA team went out into the field, that's an important part of our approach. We talked with people in and out of prison, people who had experienced criminal justice service providers, businesses, and what we kept hearing over and over again was, without a license, I can't hire somebody. It's just so critical to so many of the lower wage jobs that are available for individuals in the city. So the I-team went to work and they pulled up some data and they found a really incredible number. 46,000 Durham residents, that is 20% of the population of the county, has had their driver's licenses permanently or long-term suspended or revoked due to an unpaid ticket or a failure to appear in court, 20%. It, it, so that's what the city council and the district attorney also said, that's crazy, we had no idea that the numbers were so significant. So the team went to the former DA. The DA said, this is an issue. I've tried to focus on this issue. He had hosted a series of amnesty days where he would invite these individuals to come into his office to spend a number of hours filling out paperwork, going through a process, and trying to get some of that baggage cleared from their records. But each time he did that, 10 people, 20 people, 30 people really bailing with teaspoons and not able to get significant traction given the size of the population. So the team did what they do. They came up with a really innovative response and they said to the DA, what information do you really need to make this process happen? And the DA said, I just need their full name and I need their date of birth. And they said, what if we could just text it to you or email it to you? Can that enter a person into the amnesty program and get the record clear? Overnight, 2,500 charges against 500 people were dismissed. Think of that, I and mean, it's like incredible, easy. That led to the next big breakthrough. They, they did a, a, a public records request to the state court system because they wanted to understand the entire universe of individuals in the county who had lost their license due to a failure to appear in court. They got tens of thousands of names back. The district attorney set some criteria, so they looked at the data and they said, if we wanted to just automatically clear the, clear the fines and fees for some number of these people, what would the criteria be? They set the criteria overnight, 50,000 charges dismissed for 35,000 people. The challenge that the I-team has today, this just happened in January, two months ago. None of these individuals know that this has happened to them. <laughs> And because the city doesn't have good, accurate information on where they live and how to reach them, they now have a new challenge, which is how do we find these people, let them know that this great thing has happened and that they can now finally go to the DMV after all these years and get that license. A number of these people, no license, 10 years, 15 years. It, the personal stories here are really incredible. So advocates are now calling this a model for criminal justice reform throughout the state. Mayor uh, Shul's office is hearing from other cities around North Carolina, which is really exciting. We always love to see the good ideas spread. And really, this is the kind of work that we really want our innovation team programs to be doing. It's an example of one of those complicated issues that spans a number of different agencies, sometimes different actors within government, and there's nobody there who can kind of figure that stuff out. And so we think that that is a role for innovation and a role for these innovation teams. And we're, we're so proud to hear about that today. So finally, to close, um, what I would say is, you know, Mike started funding innovation in city halls back in 2012. At the time, there were just five innovation officers funded with public dollars across the states. Today, there are more than 70. 
For every one officer that we fund at Bloomberg Philanthropies, four are now funded with public dollars. So I think Mike's early and very bold investment in civic innovation legitimized this. Because we've been documenting the evidence of success and, and publishing it, I think we're giving confidence to other public elected officials that they can make these investments and they know that the return is going to be strong. This is also a global phenomenon. We just did some research with the OECD. International mayors are also hiring innovation officers. Increasingly, they're funding them with municipal dollars, so they're looking taxpayers in the eye and they're saying this is worth it and they're and they're beginning to use the right tools so um, altogether I think um, uh, another success one that we're proud of we really do think we're trying to create a movement around public sector innovation we meet people in city halls all the time who are amongst the most creative people Jake knows some of these folks um, from his work in civic tech really creative people that want to do the right thing find you down and so we see part of our job is to connect them with the tools and the resources that allow them to be their best selves and, and drive the kind of um, impact and change that we need to see in our city. So thank you. Look forward to answering your questions. <clears throat> thank you, Jim. Um, finally, we're going to talk about Bloomberg's Founders Projects. And there are some big Founders Projects that just don't fit into one particular uh, area that we have of our five program areas, but are very, very important um, to Mike personally and to us. So I thought I'd focus on Every Town for Gun Safety. <clears throat> Basically, this started as mayor, um, where Mike Bloomberg got sick and tired of going to hospitals and telling families that they'd lost their family members. And he said, I've had enough. There's, this is ridiculous. And I'm going to get mayors together and create an organization to fight illegal guns. And so in 2006, we created <clears throat> Mayors Against Illegal Guns with Mayor Menino of Boston. It started with 10 mayors uh, and then grew and grew and grew and grew. Um, there are 1,000 plus today in that uh, mayoral group, which is great. In 2011, I'm sorry, 12, after Sandy Hook, there was a woman named Shannon Watts who said, I'm sick of this as a mother. I can't go around watching this gun violence anymore. And she went on Facebook and decided to create a group called Moms Demand Action. And she rallied moms to really create a grassroots organization. In 2014, um, we continued to focus on what's going to happen now that Mike Bloomberg's not in City Hall. Actually, in 13, we started to think about that. And we thought we really had to continue the work and create a larger group, not just mayors, but we named it Every Town for Gun Safety. And we decided to build a movement to focus on state wins and passing background checks and combine the former mayor's group with the Moms Demand Action grassroots group. And so this 2014, um, really became a much bigger organization. We looked for, Mike, but Mike had been really primarily the only funder, and we decided that this isn't a good way to run the organization, and we diversified, reached out to a lot of other funders, and really built uh, a lot of support and also a movement. Um, in 2018, after Parkland, students got together and decided that they were going to create a group and they created Students Demand Action. So after um, basically now every town for gun safety really involves a big, big, big grassroots organization that involves moms, students, mayors, and also business people. We have a business leaders uh, group. So business leaders are either supporting the organization or also deciding how through their work they can help make a difference. So um, Dick's Sporting Goods Store, for example, decided that it was not going to sell um, illegal guns. And you know that was a business decision, and it was gutsy, and it was uh, terrific. Progress in recent years has happened not through the federal government, but through local solutions trying to solve global challenges, which was the theme of today's presentation. 21 states have passed background check laws. 
25 states, including Washington, have passed laws to keep guns away from domestic abusers. And 14 states have passed red flag laws, which allow family members and law enforcement to petition the court to remove a gun from someone who they deem dangerous or considering suicide or other type of violence. There's still a lot to do. In 2019, we're going to focus um, on passing national gun safety laws. Maybe now there's a little more hope in Washington. Um, we're going to work to hold the manufacturers more accountable. We're going to protect local laws that strengthen uh, gun safety and lift a research ban. So that's going to, that's, um, there's currently a ban on federal research on gun violence, which is ridiculous. It's really a public health epidemic. Um, we have a website, every town. Uh, .org, so we welcome everyone to come and look and see what we're doing in terms of gun safety. To roll everything up, we have many initiatives across all of our programs, five programs. We touched on some of them, but here in a snapshot are all the really big initiatives that we're you know, running right now. Again, we often try to pilot something and hand it over to a government. We don't want to be in things forever. We want to bring partners with us along so that we can really scale our work and make a big difference. So we've really touched the surface. We hope that you'll look at our social media, our annual report. Um, and now we're happy to take any questions. So.